very cryptic when it has its back to you and then it turns around and it has a, a strike like striking dappling on on the belly just an awesome little bird only place we saw it was at the airport um, laughing doves uh, turned out to be quite common as well but just a beautiful uh, striking multicolored dove um, um, one of uh, a number of different dove species that we saw in Africa but it was a beauty that you could count on seeing in, in really most habitats. Ah, the starlings. Um, we tend to think of starlings as the European starlings. And, uh, um, uh, you know, and we kind of don't like them because they become uh, pestivorous. Um, but starlings are old world birds. And um, many of them are brightly colored. And here's a, here's a, here was our first introduction to starlings. Uh, um, this is a pale winged starling. And we, we saw probably six or eight different species of starlings during the trip. Um, again, these are all birds that we just picked up at the airport. Um, here's another uh, common starling, um, metallic. A lot of metallic blue on, on this beast with the, with the red eyes. Uh, beautiful, beautiful bird. Um, and here, here's Meavy starling. This is a uh, tends to be a ground dwelling form, really long tail, almost pheasant like. Um, many of these starlings are, uh, uh, given the fact that there's quite a diversity and the fact that they have structural colors, meaning that if light hits them um, wrongly, um, they can be very difficult to identify. But when the light hits them uh, correctly, uh, a lot of them just blossom into bright colors. So there's, there's maybe starling. I call it the pheasant of the starlings. A violet backed starling, we only saw this bird one time, but uh, really a really a, a pretty um, violet backed starling. <laughs> uh, the wattled starling we saw in the savannas uh, quite a bit uh, in, in, in wetland areas. Um, not a particularly striking starling, but, but uh, quite an interesting two tone bird. And my favorite, my favorite, the greater blue-eared starling, just a magnificent metallic starling. And again, if the light doesn't hit this bird right, it looks just like a black bird. But boy, it, it, it pivots into the sunlight and it's just brilliant eye candy. Just a wonderful bird. So we took a morning walk, uh, found ourselves at the garbage dump, which is normally not an interesting place in any town, but it was here because we found the Chakma baboons. Uh, there were troops of baboons running through there. Or they found us, we're not sure which one. <laughs> yeah, you know, it was, it was, let me put it this way, it's quite a surprise. We were in their territory. <laughs> and we were aware of it. Um, males can be told from the females by the, um, the gray rump. The female's rump gets nice bright red during estrus. Uh, a lot of us have gone to zoos <laughs> probably know this. Um, and in case you can't tell from the rear whether it's a male, sometimes they show you. And uh, here's part of the troop grooming itself. We probably saw, I'm going to say maybe 60 individuals or so, and they were in no hurry. They uh, went and scavenged at the town dump as were some of the town residents scavenging right next to the baboons. And they had big canines, at least the big males did, so we kept our distance. Yeah. Okay. okay. So um, this was a common bird. Uh, there, there are a number of different types of weavers. The, as, a, as a general um, kind of bird, weavers are abundant in, in South Africa. Um, and we will be seeing a, a number of different types uh, throughout this, uh, this talk. Um, most of them build a, uh, a ball-like nest of, of a tightly woven ball-like uh, ball -like nest, um, often with an opening in the bottom or the, or the side. Um, this uh, southern mast weaver happens to be a gregarious species. Um, they're, these, these birds range from solitary to highly communal. Um, uh, in this one, each one has its own nest, but they are grouping them in a, in a tree. Um, beautiful little bird, one of many different types of weavers. The southern cordon blue. We only saw this 
uh, the, this this one time. Um, it's uh, it's a type of wax bill which are which are finch relatives. So they're they're they're, they're seed eaters, um, but a, a beautiful little marbled blue and gray bird. Ah, uh, the spectacled pigeon. Um, Another beautiful bird, um, really quite common in a lot of different habitats. Um, <clears throat> this one was actually sitting, I think we took this picture, it was sitting up on the, uh, uh, the, the, the roof of the, uh, the, the lodge we were staying at. Um, but lovely pigeon. And the good old red-headed finches, um, sexually dimorphic, obviously the males with the, with the bright red heads, um, typically eat grass seeds, uh, quite common in, in many areas and often will flock together in you know anywhere from dozens to hundreds of, of birds so neat little neat little uh, seed feeder okay from Zinpuk we went to uh on Gava Lodge by Etosha National Park in Namibia so now we're going to take you through that part of Namibia uh, here's a, just a quick look at the lodge. Each place we stayed at had its own unique features. Um, this plaza shows you the dining area that also overlooks the um, main watering hole there, um, which allowed for both day and nighttime viewing yeah. of creatures coming in. Yeah. Awesome, awesome scenery. So in, in the park, um, one of the first things we encountered were a couple of different types of crows. Uh, the Cape Crow um, is a pretty, a pretty typical black crow, but they also have pied crows there, which are just really handsome black and, and white crows. And uh, um, you know, among, among the smartest of birds, uh, the pied crows in particular are, are known to stash food, which is a and, and can remember it for long periods of time, which is a useful uh, trait when you're in a desert-like habitat where resources are limited. Beautiful crow and loud and raucous. And eating. Oh yeah, and they're, they're kind of hiding out in a, in a, in a the rib cage of something. <laughs> <clears throat> and what's a trip to Africa without seeing ostriches? Um, largest bird in the world, they're flightless, good runners, um, certainly uh, well able to defend themselves by, by kicking. Um, we were fortunate to see wild type ostriches in the parks that we were at. There's not a lot of purebred wild ostriches left. Um, there, there's a huge industry in Southern Africa of uh, rearing ostriches as food and they've imported um, Somalian stock, which are which are a smaller variety of ostriches, and many of these have escaped and interbreed with the the native common ostriches. So it's really really common to to see hybrid ostriches, especially which are a little bit smaller, slightly different color pattern, um, if you're in more developed areas. But you know we're out in the in the desert boonies here, and so we were fortunate to be able to see actual wild type common ostriches. Yeah, it's kind of fun because you're just going down the highway. You're not even in a park. You're on, you know, going from one place to another. And, oh, there's a there's an ostrich. Oh, there's an elephant. Oh, there's um, a giraffe. And there's the rare four-headed ostrich that we saw too. Which... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So here's uh, you know we looked at our gregarious weaver early. This is the sociable sociable weaver. Um, this is a communally nesting bird, um, builds a single large, huge nest. I mean, you're looking at that, that tree in the upper left, I mean, that's, you know, that, that's like a Volkswagen bus hanging up in the tree. It's just, it's just massive with potentially hundreds of thousands of weaver birds all sharing chambers with, within, that, uh, within that nest. The, the weavers themselves are, are pretty nondescript little uh, little birds, but uh, as a group, they make an amazing, amazing nest. And then here's the opposite extreme, a couple examples of, of solitary weavers. Again, they're, they're making these complex spherical nests. 
Um, the scaly weaver on the left, we only saw that one time. A beautiful little, beautiful little bird. And then the, the, the spectacled weaver on the right uh, is one that we saw in a number of different habitats. But these are these are birds that, for the most part, nest by themselves, or depending on resources, occasionally may nest gregariously. Uh, this is this was one of my 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 favorite. Uh, raptors, the, the, the goshawks, uh, they tend to have very long legs and short rounded wings, um, extremely agile aerial predators. Um, so if you're a small rodent or, or reptile moving around on the surface of the ground, this is probably your worst nightmare right here. These things will swoop down out of the blue and, and carry you off. Bustards are an interesting group of birds. They're, uh, they're, they're related to the, cr the cranes and rails, um, but many of them are, are adapted to terrestrial and uh, even dry, hot desert-like areas, uh, often uh, um, moving uh, singly or sometimes in, in small, small groups through the vegetation. Um, but again, a, a, a number of different types of of these birds uh, were observed during our trip, and then these are these are several of the uh, the ones that we saw. The Cory bustard, in particular, is kind of a top shelf bustard. Uh, really, quite a large bird. Really, really pretty handsome. Um, and that one has the little feather out of whack. Yeah. Ah, the lapwings. I, I I think we had lapwings in the title of this talk, and uh, um, they're related to. Related to plovers, so uh, they tended they well they are plovers, but they're relatively large bodied with short build. Um, you can find these in wetlands, um, but many of them do very well in dry terrestrial habitats as well. The blacksmith uh, lapwing was one that was pretty much ubiquitous. We saw that in a lot of different places. Uh, really nice, striking black and white uh, lapwing. Um, Long-toed lapwing uh, tended to be a little bit more uh, restricted to wet areas. Um, we never did really see that one in, in, in just bone dry areas like we did the blacksmith. A um, couple others, uh, the crowned lapwing, pretty handsome bird. But I think my favorite lapwing at all was uh, the white-headed lapwing. It used to be called the waddled lapwing for obvious reasons and not sure why the experts deemed it to be the white-headed lapwing instead. Um, but that's what, it's, that's what it's currently called. But beautiful group of birds. OK, so one of the cool things that they had at uh, the Angaba Lodge was a, like a half mile hike to the, to the game blind. So there's Randy with his binocs at the game blind. Yeah, that's a cushy blind, by the way. <clears throat> Padded seats. Padded seats, drinks. You know, I'm, I wouldn't have been surprised if they brought uh, afternoon cocktails down, but we were out and about in the afternoon. This is a great place to go after lunch or before uh, breakfast in the morning. So uh, we did that a few times. There's just a few things we've seen around watering holes. There's a nice giraffe that came in. Uh, up in the upper right hand corner, there's um, a, a carcass, and that's actually a, an elephant carcass. Uh, we'll talk a little more about elephants. You get, might get sick of seeing elephants, but um, we got to see a lot of elephants. And uh, lioness. So just a, just a quick overview of some of the birds that we saw there. Um, the, the, name, the names are there. Guinea fowls were pretty common. Um, only place we saw the green pigeon, just a, a lovely, lovely bird. Um, the white-browed sparrow weavers, obviously another type of weaver bird, um, were common there and one of those birds that was actually common in most of the places we went in South Africa. And then the, uh, the Franklins were a, another group of interesting birds. We saw three or four different types of, of Franklins. Most of those are uh, terrestrial scavengers and um, many of them have some kind of funny looking faces on them. <laughs> So um, I'm going to give you a little idea of what it was like being next to this uh, Etosha National Park. We did spend a lot of time in there. Um, it's huge. 
uh, we covered a very small portion of it and saw an awful lot of stuff. Um, at my technical term. Um, Etosha means great white place. And you see that white blob, that is a salt pan. It covers a quarter of the park. It can actually be seen from space. Uh, it was formed as a lake over 100 million years ago. There's very little vegetation there. There's some salt lick hillocks. And there are a few ants. Um, and in wet years, about a million flamingos use that salt pan area as breeding grounds. Um, here's a fun fact. The Atosha salt pan was used as a film backdrop for 2001 Space Odyssey, you know, in case you were wondering. <laughs> All right, so we said you'd see elephants. You will see elephants. And in fact, they're coming to the watering hole. This is a great place to uh, pick up birds, hood stock, you can see them in the back. Yes, the elephants peeing, just in case you wanted to see how much they could pee at once. We got some baby elephants there. This was late afternoon, maybe around four o'clock or so. A lot of things were coming into the watering hole. Which are especially important sites these days because the, this, this region in general has been in a, a very, very long, prolonged drought. So um, water availability is, is much reduced from historical levels. So these watering holes are super important for the animals, um, but also provides areas uh, for wildlife watching that are pretty extraordinary. Yeah, Randy mentioned the water shortage. Um, the might hear bird call here. This is the worst drought. There's the bird. The worst drought that Namibia's had in a hundred years. In fact, they're calling it the hundred year drought. And that was consistent throughout, oops, sorry. Um, consistent throughout um, all of South Africa. Just to give you an idea what it looked like, uh, where we spent a lot of time on these game drives. So, okay, so we went from uh, Angava Lodge to Camp Kipwe in Damaraland, still in Namibia, and getting even drier than where we were. Um, on our way, we stopped at an indigenous village called the Himba village. And really, this is a, it's a tourist stop. Um, the village has only been around for 10 years, um, but it's to give the tourists an idea of what it's, what it was like. Um, and, and some people still do dress in native dress, um, but it's a convenient little tourist stop to just uh, kind of give you an idea of what it's like to live in these harsh conditions. It's also, um, money also goes into an orphanage in that town. So, you know, what do you do when it's dry and dusty and you need to hang stuff up? Well, you just use the trees. So here's a, here's a Himba woman who's about 18 years old and you're gonna get an idea of why they have the hair the way they do. Um, and her, this is her son. And I'll tell you now, if, if their breasts offend you, then look away because look you're, away. You're, you're gonna see a few. Um, here she is, she's giving us a good view of her outfit. Um, she was very personable. Uh, and the hair, I'll explain more about that. But these are goat skin and calf skin. And she's got her baby in what is the equivalent of a baby carrier that's um, made out of goat skin, has metal on it. A lot of their clothing um, have fiber and metal and even some traditional cloth. See, here's a little close up of metal. You add these metal bracelets as you get older 
Um, you had your, another layer when you get married and then keep adding to it as you get older. Um, and then in the back, you can see how the uh, calf skin and goat skin has been kind of decorated and, and frilled. So here's just a close up of belt. Um, very elaborate uh, tool work. The hair, the hair is really interesting. Um, they use okra and fat um, and weave that into the hair. It makes like a, a clay. Uh, the woman on the right, she actually has ash in her hair. It's uh, getting her hair ready before she puts the, the okra and uh, clay on. It's, uh, it's very much a cultural beauty uh, and it's also something that helps protect them from the heat and insects. And we'll show you a little close up of the hair. It's basically like a cool, very cool, damp feeling clay. Um, women, men get to take baths with water sparingly. Uh, women take smoke baths. And this is gonna, the smoke helps um, with parasites and as a protectant and a deodorant. And they also rub the okra on their bodies. How old is this woman? Uh, this relates we started 2010, now it's uh, nine years. Yeah, we were there a year ago. How old are they? And the way it is not to the neck, it is to kill the insect and parasite. It is the way how they dismiss their to clean their body. So that's like a, a myrrh, it's uh, and and cork wood, and it's uh, very fragrant. Little little acrid from the smoke, but kids are kids, no matter where you go. Kids are kids. Um, they played with some of the folks on our trip and the kid on the right actually has an orange peel that he turned into lips. Goat corral, goats uh, are an important source of meat, fat, and skins. And traditionally, one stick at a time, that's your gate. There's no real gate. And of course, this woman has all kinds of helpers. Randy found a few termites. Termites. Uh, even, uh, I mean, termites tend to be moisture loving creatures. And when the rains come, um, if they come, when they come, uh, certainly uh, insect activity in general would increase and a lot of termites would swarm. Um, normally, you're not going to see much termite presence in these desert areas, except for these giant termite mounds. Um, these are fungus growing termites, uh, some of the most elaborate insect societies in the world. But uh, these, these mounds, which would be scattered across the landscape, uh, sometimes even considerably higher than the one here, um, have uh, fungus gardens deep inside these the termite workers would forage in underground tunnels come up on the surface clip pieces of grass carry that back and feed it to the fungus and then harvest little fruiting bodies from the fungus there would be a giant uh, queen one single queen in each of these colonies which may live up to 50 years and uh, perhaps millions of, of, of workers um, really really uh, incredible insect societies um, eking out uh, an existence in this uh, very harsh landscape. Giant fungus growing termites. And that surface of the termite mound is there are bits of rock incorporated, bits of stick, and it's just hard as heck. We tried digging into it and we could get nowhere. Yeah, it's pretty it's pretty amazing that those little soft bodied insects can build a structure like this. So off we went to um, our uh, a walk around the camp. I'm, we're showing you this view to give you an idea of you know, our tiny little space in this great, great desert. It's 
pretty harsh conditions and it's very, very red there. So just um, some scenes around the camp because this was one of the more interesting places. You basically were living in rocks. Yeah, that's the lodge. There it is right there. <laughs> pretty well camouflaged. <laughs> Yeah, the very top is the water tower. It looks like the top of the rocks, but it's actually the water tower. They did an incredible job with the architecture. So there's the water tower. And it's also the place where we could uh, walk up the hill and have a good sundowner, uh, meaning drinks and snacks, and then uh, watch the sunset. Just a view from the front lounge. This little round building was main dining area. And yes, there is even a little pool tucked into the rocks. It's beautifully landscaped within this natural giant pile of rocks. <laughs> and sand and red dirt. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Um, that was our house. Uh, the, the roof is twigs. There are all kinds of little flowers there. This is how the uh, units were heated. Outside of your unit was this wood furnace. And you didn't really need it in the daytime, but man, at nighttime, and the first thing in the morning, it was cold. It got chilly. Uh, circular room. This is our bathroom. And normally this is not the kind of thing we would show you, but there's a story. It's outside. It's a, it, it, they're beautiful little bathrooms and actually more private than it looks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it was great for wildlife watching too. Yeah. Here's the view from uh, the, the toilet looking back. Here's the view looking toward the dining area. That's pretty much the view you get from the shower. And we had visitors. These guys came in and attacked mirrors and so you could be in the bathroom and watch the birds come in or watch little little desert mice run through your bathroom. And if that freaks you out, this is not a trip for you. So uh, the, the birds in the previous uh, image and these here are great rufous sparrows. Uh, one of a number of different sparrows, uh, as you can imagine, uh, you know, there are dozens of species of, of sparrows in Africa, but this is really one of the uh, kind of the larger, uh, handsomer species, sexually dimorphic, uh, the male with 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 more of the the rufous coloring, um, and in uh, in some respects a little bit um, house sparrowish, in that the male, especially the dominant male, will develop that black throat patch. Um, so uh, they're great rufous sparrows, and they're looking great in the mirror themselves. Um, Another, another sparrow that we came across that was really quite handsome were cake sparrows. And this, this one was pretty easy to identify once you realize that there's a white C-shaped pattern on, on the side of the head of the males. Um, and I just considered that to be C for cake. So if you saw a sparrow with that C-like pattern on the head, it's a cake sparrow. Lovely sparrows. Um, uh, just a, a Quick overlook at uh, a few of the, the birds that we saw that kind of caught my attention. Um, the Bachmacherai is, is actually a, a type of uh, bush shrike, um, an in insect eater. Um, the double banded sand or the sand grouses, we saw a number of different sand grouses. Um, just bizarre little kind of short legged birds that would shuffle through the, uh, the, the desert and uh, pick around for, for food. Um, the mountain weed ear was pretty interesting. Um, those, those are polymorphic. The males are polymorphic. The typical males are just sort of a, a two-tone gray and uh, a gray and tan color. Um, but there's a there is a pied morph, which is somewhat black and white. And then uh, this is the dark morph, the only one that has a white cap on its head. So uh, we we felt and and the rarest of the morphs. So we felt lucky that we saw a dark morph uh, mountain. Uh, weedy, and then uh, um, kind of our one of our earlier introductions to the hornbills, and we saw a number of different hornbills throughout the trip, and we're going to see a, a, more of these, uh, but characterized by you know 
long curved forcep like bills for uh, grabbing and manipulating uh, fruits and berries and, and that type of thing. But this southern yellow billed is a typical uh, hornbill in many habitats. The pearl spotted owlet was a really cool little cool little owl. It wasn't huge. I'd say it was sort of a melon sized owl, hence the name owlet because it's tiny. Um, but it has false eye spots in the back of its head. And you can see on the left uh, image, there's, there's these uh, sort of black dots surrounded by lighter uh, feathering, which gives the impression of false eyes. And, and these birds are considerably more day active than most owls. Uh, certainly active uh, uh, in, in dawn and dusk and sometimes even out to, to, to mid morning. And the idea is if you're an owl that's going to be active in the day, why not have some eye spots on the back of your head to deter predators that might be trying to sneak up on you from behind. Um, beautiful little owlet. Just a, another look at the, the camp and some of the flowers. We actually, uh, I will speak up for the entomologist here. Um, it was so dry. We saw very few. So dry. <laughs> so I was really, I was really excited to, to, to see ants in, in South Africa, particularly the ponerines, which are these giant primitive ants, which are common in many habitats. And uh, boy, I don't think I saw more than one or two ponerines the whole time I was there. It was just so dry. Everything was hunkered down. So it's a good thing he enjoys birds now. So a few other, uh, we did see a few reptiles. Yeah, lovely lizards. And we went out uh, in the desert at night with our guides, um, just right out from our, our lodge to go find some scorpions. And we found three species, and this is one, and show you with uh, natural light and or flash and uh, UV light which is how we were finding the scorpions. Right, classical way of finding scorpions at night. You go out with a black light and, and they fluoresce. Um, otherwise, you have great difficulty seeing these things. But boy, when they glow like that, they pop right out. All right, so off we go to uh, the Mara land. So leaving, leaving our camp and going to search for the the Namibia mountain elephants are, are technically desert elephants, but some people call them mountain elephants because they, we found them in the mountains. So here's a town. It was, this was our jumping off point to go into those mountains you see behind it uh, to go seek out this elephant. Um, interestingly, you do have to elephant proof your town water supply. You have to, build these big walls around it and you see the one in the center has had some uh, bricks knocked off of it. Um, this is a constant uh, maintenance issue. Uh, elephant seat, you know, come find the water and they tear stuff up to get at it. They don't care about, you know, your pipe. And more cute kids that are, I'll say hi to you. Um, we start into the mountains and uh, the predominant browse there is this seaweed elephant root. root. Um, that is, it's, if you've ever been to Arizona, this grows in these dry riverbeds like the cottonwoods do in Arizona. So how do you find elephants? Well, you find some fresh dung, you find some fresh pat tracks, and hopefully at the end of them, you'll find an elephant like the one on the right. The, our guides were really excited to find these elephants and they're really kind of hard to spot. As you can see, they're fairly well camouflaged, uh, but this is a rare trait. Well, they, I them. think they were, they were, these elephants are known for going over mountains <laughs> and that's something that our guides hadn't really seen much of in the past. So they were particularly excited by the fact that these elephants were climbing while we were there. And if you look, it, to us, it looks like he's eating stick. Yeah. Obviously, they get some nutrition out of it. It's a little closer look. We, um, after we found them on the mountain, we were able to find them in uh, one of these dry stream beds. 
and uh, and just grab and go, grab and go. This is the lower right or lower left corner is a baby. Um, I forgot there was, yeah, you can see the baby eat. Those are thorns on that. You saw the elephant eating sticks, the baby's eating the leaf with thorn. Um, okay, so we went off to uh, in the afternoon to check out a mountain and some organ pipe formations of basalt. Uh, and as you see, they had really fine facilities there. <laughs> they had a little portalette and a, uh, a shack that was called reception. Then we went nearby to Twyfel Fontaine. Um, which basically means uh, it's uh, it's an it's an area that has over 2,500 petroglyphs that which were created by the San Bush people anywhere from a thousand to ten thousand years ago. There are rock paintings there. Uh, there's hunting scenes, uh, bows and arrows, um, antelope, zebra, giraffe, lion, and remarkably, um, there's even a carving of a seal. <clears throat> Excuse me, and the ocean's over 60 miles away. The name comes from um, a topographer who found a spring there and attempted to set his family up, but he gave up because the spring, that's his uh, house there in the lower left, gave up because the spring just wasn't uh, able to sustain people or animals. A local farmer nicknamed um, the Twyfel means it's questionable or doubtful, and then the Fontaine is spring. So somebody had a sense of humor about that. Cultural heritage site. Yeah. Tall areas where you could climb up and see some of these. Uh, the seals in the upper upper left. There's hunter on the right, and there's some giraffe and antelope and, and a lion with a super long tail. Just wanted to give you a peek at those. So. Uh, <clears throat> Everywhere we went, uh, we saw hornbills. Um, some some were ubiquitous uh, in, throughout South Africa. Some were uh, restricted to certain areas. Both of these birds were uh, ones that we found in, in Damarland. Um, the red-billed hornbill and uh, Montiero's hornbill. Uh, these are both caskless species, which means that the bill is not particularly modified other than the fact it's long and curved and forcep-like. Um, we'll see later um, an example of a horn bill that does have a, a distinct cask on the uh, bill, and we'll talk more about that when we, we get there. So. so we also did a tour of the Bay Area. Randy will explain some of the birds we saw there. So, so we're on we're on the coast now, so I mean it's it's absolutely amazing to go um, from these harsh desert habitats uh, to wetland areas and then to the the ocean coast. Um, the, uh, the the changes in in scenery and habitat and wildlife is, is just staggering. Um, but here are, here are a few birds that um, are, are are common to the coastal areas. Uh, Cormorants, uh, one of several different types of cormorants we saw. Um, the, the common sandpiper is a common sandpiper, beautiful, beautiful little bird, and um, many different types of gulls. But two really, really common ones are the Hartlib's gull, and then the kelp gull, which is just this massive, massive gull. Um, we saw greater flamingos there. Um, I always sort of consider these to be the the gangly but graceful birds. Um, the uh, the one on the upper right uh, is pretending to be a hot ostrich with its head hidden in the water, um, but in actuality they'll they'll take their 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 bills and stir up the the substrate, the sand on the bottom. They'll also kick with their legs, um, stirring up material as they shuffle al along. Um, and I was I was lucky enough to catch this one bird in flight. It's really interesting how they they balance themselves. Um, 
because by the way, all of the pictures in, in this show were, and video were taken by Kathy and myself, um, for better or for worse. Um, you know, they're not all the greatest quality, but they're all ours, so I guess that's something. Greater flamingos, lovely birds. Yeah, this is um, this is showing where we were on the coast. Um, we went to the Cape Cross Seal Reserve. It gives you an idea of that. Um, this was really crowded. Uh, they're very stinky and very noisy. There's anywhere from 10,000 to 210,000 uh, seals, more during breeding season. Uh, they are everywhere. They uh, let me give you a look at how noisy it is. So we saw a lot of pups. Um, females, females ovulate about 10 days after birth and mate. Uh, then they delay embryo development for four months. The so pups are born in March through April. We were here in uh, mid-September, so um, that's about how old the pups are. The pups wean at eight to 11 months. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of pups. If you listen closely, you might even hear this first pup suckling. Look at those eyes. There it is. Somebody's looking for his mom, and that wasn't it. Very, very noisy. Um, it is a circle of life there, uh, plenty of food if you're a brown hyena. Uh, this one was uh, feasting on a dead pup. There are confrontations. And uh, this is also a brown hyena. Don't feel sorry for it. It looks like it's a young one that has demodectic mange. Uh, generally, they'll outgrow that. Uh, but again, plenty of food around. In fact, this one was feasting on the carcass with the other one. And uh, we did see a number of uh, skulls there. The teeth are really well worn and you see the bird tracks on the left all around. So huh. everybody gets food. So there's a, a look at the bay. It was extremely cold. Um, and on the boat, we did have some visitors. We had a seal come up to say hi. Just literally landed himself on the boat. And uh, Pelican came to say hi. So there are a couple different uh, pelican species in South Africa, but the, uh, the most striking is the great white pelican. It's just a, a, a huge bird. Um, there were many of these birds uh, in, in the Bay Area. Um, but at least one had become habituated to, to humans. I think this was probably the standard trick um, that this uh, bird performed. Uh, as soon as we were underway on our tour boat, this thing comes flying in and, and lands right in the middle of the, of the deck and goes around and starts uh, uh, sort of begging for food. So there's a, there's a well-known uh, poem uh, limerick, and I'm going to go ahead and read it to you. A wonderful bird is the pelican. His bill can hold more than his belican. So um, referring to the fact that they have a dispensable uh, pouch between the lower mandibles, and the limerick continues, he can hold in his beak enough food for a week, but I'm damned if I see how the hell he can. So that, that little limerick is often attributed to Ogden Nash, but it was really written by uh, Dixon Merritt in, in uh, 1913. So, but look at look at the look at the bill on that thing. Is that is that unbelievable? It's just really lovely. So that concludes our tour of the bay. <laughs> <laughs> um, we went from our lodge uh, to Windhoek to catch a plane to Victoria Falls. So uh, literally, this was like a day and a half trip uh, at the falls. 
but just to show you what it's like, it's very colonial at the Victoria Falls Hotel, uh, very relaxed, um, but you're aware that uh, there are armed guards because there are visitors uh, that could cause some human animal confrontation like the uh, Chakma baboon and our um, peccary there. Um, so we did find that at most of the lodges, we were not able to walk from you know, to and from the dining areas in our in our lodge um, without having an armed guard. Especially after dark. Yeah, or before dawn. <laughs> so just a look at the falls. Um, it's vast. But this will give you a little overview. You're bathed in mist. So more hornbills, believe it or not. So um, I think well, my second my second favorite hornbill is the trumpeter hornbill. Um, this this is one that does have a well developed cask on the top of its bill. These are structural reinforcements for strength. They can be used for balancing, and they can also be uh, uh, sound chambers for making resonating uh, noises as these birds call. So trumpeter with a cask on the left, and then the crown hornbill, which is uh, really a cask of um, species. Robin chats are really, uh, are Rufus Rump Robins, to put it, to put it simply. They're robin-like birds, and they have uh, Rufus Rumps on them. Um, beautiful little om omnivores. A um, couple different types of fire finches. This is uh, Jameson's fire finch. Beautiful, beautiful little birds, um, common um, in, in dry areas and like, uh, like finches generally are seed eaters. Um, the Hadada ibis, um, a, a large ir iridescent ibis um, named the, uh, due to its harsh Hadada -da -da flight call. Okay, from Victoria Falls, off we go to uh, the Okamanga Delta. Um, just to look at the lodge that we did find a wasp and uh, we had we had mongooses running around. Uh, lots of elephants. Um, my favorite elephant encounter of all time. It was a mud hole here and uh, there was a swimming pool next to the mud hole and I was fortunate to this one. This one, there we go. Get nose to nose with an elephant. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> it was about a half hour encounter. So um, a lot of wetlands in, in this area. So again, uh, we, we see these interesting transitions from very dry desert type areas to bodies of water with uh, um, marshes and wetlands on the perimeter. Um, Chicanas with a typical uh, type of uh, wetland bird with, with big feet, um, um, certainly well represented in South America and as well as Africa. Um, here, here's a crake with uh, huge, huge feet, so they're, they're able to kind of often pad somewhat across the surface of the water on uh, slightly submerged vegetation. More wading birds, in fact there's just tons of wading birds in this area. Um, handsome wood piper, sandpiper. Um, the squacko heron was a common little heron. Uh, we, we saw that one everywhere. It's, I might say it's analogous to the green heron we have here. It's just really, really common little heron. But then we get some large, uh, colorful, bizarre birds, the wattled crane, um, 
and the, uh, the, the really amazing saddle bill stork with a little yellow kind of satellite structure on the bill. Beautiful birds. Um, but the marabou stork, which um, is somewhere between hideous and handsome, depending on your view. It's got a, it, its head is bald and it's got that huge pendulous um, kind of waddle hanging down from it. Um, yet it still flies gracefully, go figure. And the Goliath heron, which is the largest heron in the world, stands uh, up to five feet tall. Amazing, amazing heron, big bird. Um, spoonbills, African spoonbill, we saw a, a number of those. And I think one of my favorite ones is the water thick knee, um, named because it appears to have thick knees, a little wading bird, but beautiful little, little bird. So just a uh, look along the river. Um, that is not a pile of dirt. Um, crocodiles uh, can be very camouflaged. That's a big crocodile. Yeah, we'll get a little closer look at it. A lot of hoofstock. stock. We actually have uh, native bee. Yeah, these are, these are true um, African bees, um, very aggressive. These are the bees that were hybridized with Italian bees to create the so-called killer bees. But this is, this is, these are, these are true wild type African bees. So uh, honey bees that just happen to be very aggressive, which is a good trait when you're in such a harsh habitat. So uh, we'll closer up look at our elephants and crocodiles. Um, we got to see a lot of these on the river. And Speaking of camouflage, yeah. more hoof stock. And yes, more elephants. And hippos. Um, we're at 830. Um, we have more. So we'll we'll continue until you cut us off. Yeah, we'll keep going if anybody needs to leave, but we'll let it out. Give you a look at the hippos moving around. Some brief clips. This is oh, a little confrontation. This is pretty common in the afternoon. There's a squawk heron out in the middle there. Look at that. Birds are coming in. There's a jacana up on top. It's nice that the hippos kick up food for the birds. So, a little look at sunset and some more of the animals. You see where they uh, where they like to keep close to the hoofstock so they can get some food. Just a wide view of some of the savanna areas. So, uh, western cattle egrets were fairly common in the in the area. Uh, obviously, closely associated with cattle, they'll. They'll either glean uh, ectoparasites from the surfaces of these animals. Uh, this one happens to be standing on a Cape buffalo. Um, I personally wouldn't want to stand on a Cape buffalo. Um, and then they'll also uh, follow these uh, large animals around uh, and pick up insects that are, that are flushed by the passing. Uh, an another really neat association are the oxpeckers. We saw two different types. Um, featured here are the, are the, are the red-billed. Um, they'll, they're adapted to, uh, to groom and clean ectoparasites. They have sort of flattened scissor-like bills um, and uh, really strong grasping feet and a stiff tail for bracing. Uh, some of these structures actually are, are somewhat woodpecker-like. The way these birds walk around on these animals, it's like a woodpecker climbing a, climbing a tree. Um, so neat, neat specialization. Okay, we're, we're done with that area. Now we're going to Camp Takanaka. Um, and that's pretty much how you say it. So little view of us trying to cram ourselves into this little airplane and uh, some views from the air of the Delta. It's getting a lot more lush now. So more lush means we get to see some other species. Um, we get to see some wild dogs. Um, and they're getting ready for the evening hunt. Everyone's kind of gathering and watching. 
waiting. It was very windy. We've got some juvenile um, zebra that were doing some territorial displays for us. All these hoof stocks running around um, kicks up a lot of dust. So this is was one of Randy's favorite places in in Moraney Park, um, the uh, Paradise Pools. Lots and lots of bird life there. You look, it looks a lot like the uh, salt marshes in the southern U.S. with all these trees that are dead from salt wash. Well, just amazing habitat to find this in kind of a desert-like area. Uh, mm. Uh, several several different groups of, of birds were common to this area. The, the beaters, uh, which, which are all very colorful um, and, and highly adept aerial predators. Uh, very, very common to see these birds perch and then go swooping off to catch an insect airily and then return to their perch uh, in, in, in very typical fly catching manner. Beautiful little birds. Uh, the, the rollers are another group of of, of powerful large built birds that fly catch from perches. Um, look at those things. I mean, they're just awesome birds. And we never got to see them roll, so sorry. <laughs> they're cold. And then the kingfishers. Oh my my goodness, a really, really nice kingfisher. Um, and the, the top shelf kingfisher of them all is the malachite. I mean, that is just an incredibly patterned bird. Uh, the pied was also very, very handsome. And, we saw a number of other uh, really, really nice kingfishers, an incredible group of, of uh, birds that uh, occur in this area. Uh, the hammercock, now this is a really bizarre bird. It's, um, it's, it's in its own group. There, there are no close uh, relatives. It has almost a claw hammer type of head um, known for building these huge dome stick nests. I mean, absolutely huge nests. Um, pretty, pretty powerful bird. Um, it, it is able to display uh, with, with the, the head feathers spread wide there that you can see in the bottom left, and it uses that powerful beak to, to probe in these mud flats for invertebrates. Quite a strange bird. Um, a, another one that I was really excited to, to see was the hoopoe, uh, the Eurasian hoopoe. Um, it's just, it, it, it's just a special bird in the way it's patterned and shaped. Um, very, very long bill for probing the ground for invertebrates. Um, typically, the crest is kind of collapsed when the bird is relaxed, but as it gets um, more and more on guard, the bottom left, it's the crest is half raised, and on the bottom right, that bird's pissed off. The crest is fully erect and probably trying to make the bird look bigger and badder. Um, the the, the fruit-eating barbets are also really colorful colorful birds with really powerful bills for excavating uh, dead wood. Um, and we, we saw the black collared barbet in particular quite frequently, really a handsome bird. The crested barbet uh, as well as a nice bird. Now my favorite hornbill of all are these southern giant hornbills. These, uh, these things travel around in groups, um, um, almost akin to you know, seeing a large group of turkeys in, out, in, out in the field. Um, they, they can fly, uh, per, perhaps awkwardly, but uh, um, they spend most of their time foraging on the ground. Amazing, amazing hornbills. Um, number of bush shrikes, um, which tend to be insectivorous. Uh, the gray-headed has a really, really powerful bill. So you can be a hard-shelled beetle, but it won't matter because with a bill like that, you'll just get crushed. Um, helmet shrikes. Uh, are are known for their bristly foreheads. Um, social birds. Um, here's a white helmet shrike, and just really a really a handsome bird. So we did a little uh, savanna watching. We did finally find a, a small group pride of lions. <laughs> and yes, even big cats give you a bliss. There you go. Isn't that a regal picture? 
we did bag our big five. We did find a leopard on our very last game drive in this area. And uh, right there with this trumpet flower. Gail on one side had just finished feeding. So that allowed us to find it. Didn't care that there were five or six uh, safari vehicles around and everybody took their turn. So off we go to Cape Town. Uh, we split from the group at this point. Most people went home and Randy and I had done an extension to Cape Town, which we're really glad we did. Very different habitat. Um, this is Table Mountain, which overlooks Cape Town. There's a lot of vegetation up there that you can only find up there. Um, we'll apologize to Hardy right now. Didn't identify everything. It'll take us forever to do that. But here's a little look at the vegetation and some creatures in the upper right hand. Rock, the rock, rock, rock hyraxes, yeah. So lichen in the lower left yeah. corner. So yeah, we're, we're at a considerably higher elevation than, than the, the town itself. And Hardy made us go here. <laughs> and we're still pissed at him that we did. Yeah. No, this is this is a must-see must place, the Kirsten Bach Botanical Gardens. Just absolutely marvelous. Any Probably any kind of protea you want. This is just going to give you a sample. We did find a tortoise. That was fun. Yeah, that's that's actually a fairly rare tortoise. So we were uh, we were pretty excited to, to find that right in the gardens. And look, and a couple other insects. A, fl a flower beetle and a little bee of some kind. Oh, and an ant. <laughs> um, they have this uh, rainforest walkway, the boom slang or boom sling, I think it's called. Uh, it gets you up above things and, you know, People like walking on it. It's fun. Uh, Cape, the, the so-called Cape Widow Bird, um, or the Yellow Bishop. Um, curiously, it, it's the male who is widow-like, um, dressed in black, um, but strongly dimorphic, dimorphic bird. Um, again, um, a, a type of weaver. So we got maybe five-ish minutes. Okay. Uh, uh, Cape sugarbird, uh, yeah. These are these are close closely associated with with proteas, um, so they they basically uh, visit these flowers and, and suck nectar. Um, somewhat re somewhat related to um, sunbirds, but but still still distinct. Um, the a view at the Cape of Good Hope, or way up, and let me tell you. It was freakishly cold. There were um, cormorants in the in the crevices of the cliffs. Um, and now we went off to the penguin. Oh sure. yeah, there's a there is a um, the the African penguin is uh, is is a severely declining species. It, it, it was once commonly found uh, on the uh, in coastal areas on, on South Africa. Um, now it's pretty much confined to this one preserve area. There's perhaps 500 birds in, in this area. Um, here, here are just a, a, a few shots of this, of this bird. Um, but we're, we're looking at these birds from, from walkways that are in this preserve. Um, but it was nice to be able to get up close to these, um, these, these rare declining penguins. Um, and uh, just a few more birds from the Cape of Good Hope that I just, I just thought were nice. The, the Cape bunting was just a lovely little bunting. Uh, the African oyster catcher was just just completely striking. Uh, we, we saw the Cape cormorants a lot on the rocky hillsides, and there's all kinds of terns here, great crested. Um, so it was a great place to bird watch. We went to the Pearl Bird Sanctuary, which was also a water treatment and sewage plant. Uh, this was actually a great place to uh, pick up a number of birds. You see some little weaver nests on the left hand side oh, yeah. at the bottom and uh, a little bit of wildflower vegetation. And then we headed off to Junker, Junker Shuck Nature Reserve. 
we don't have a ton of pictures from here because we spent most of the time bird watching and <laughs> turning our we have turned our guide into a bird watcher. He WhatsApps us now and then and sends us pictures. Hey, is this such and such bird? Right. So yeah, he wanted to take us to wineries and we said, Hell no, we're going birding. You wanna go? <laughs> <laughs> we do have that uh reputation. Yeah. So what what's what's a trip to Africa without seeing sunbirds? Uh, yeah, small, active, very colorful birds with long bills for uh, obtaining nectar um, from from a variety of foot plants. They'll go to proteas, which are the sugar bushes, um, but they'll go to other plants as well. Um, we probably saw eight or nine different species of sunbirds. Uh, there's there's four in this image. Uh, uh, the southern double collared was really a nice bird. The orange breasted were, were, were great birds. Um, going to the next one. But the top shelf of all the sunbirds are the malachites. This just brilliant, iridescent, metallic green sunbird. Um, we, we were looking for these. Our trip was three weeks and we had our eyes open uh, for these the whole time, even though many of the habitats we were in, uh, would, you wouldn't find them. But um, those last few days in, in the, the southern tip of Africa, we were really hoping to find these and we found these right at the end of our trip. So it was really kind of a special experience. That's what we have. So um, thanks and thanks for staying a little late. And I guess uh, now we take questions. Yeah, I have a couple of questions left. here in the chat. Um, Lynette asked. Um, Hi, Lynette. Did you go through a guide service or did you plan this trip on your own? Yes. <laughs> um, actually, Dick Mills was the one who set it up for us. And then um, he helped us uh, get our Cape Town uh, tour um, separately. But we also, he was also having us work directly with some of the guides um, for some, some of the pieces, the independent pieces. Um, Dick did a fabulous job uh, getting us a chance to see the incredible diversity in this area. And it was our very first trip to Africa. It will not be our last. <clears throat> How long were you there? Three weeks total. And I, I didn't want to come back. I'd probably still be there if I didn't have to come back. It was, it was really a wonderful, magical experience. And... Uh, I mean, I, I could have stayed three months. It was, it was really, really a, a special thing to do. And Liz asked, um, how does a gosh hawk chant? <laughs> I guess she's wanting an impression <laughs> from you, Randy. I don't know. <laughs> well, we'll, we'll pull up the uh, Sarsol app and send you a, uh, a, a recording. How's that? <laughs> I don't know. Other questions? I, 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 we saw them fairly regularly, but they were always very silent, observant birds when we saw them. And the final question listed here is from Dave. Uh, he asked, what camera and lens did you use for your bird photos? Well, that's a question for me. Um, for I, the small camera I had is a Canon FX740. So it has a, it's a compact camera with a zoom lens. We did not carry giant cameras. Uh, we were, other people did that were on the trip with us. It was a very small group. Uh, we had 11, no, nine people total. Um, they had the giant cameras. We had cameras that we could deal with. Well, I had, the, I had a Canon power shot. Yeah. yeah he had se a, 70 times. SX70 was his and I had the 740, but they're both Canons. Um, you can do a lot with these compact cameras now. Um, yeah, we couldn't get the absolute crispest image from a distance, but it served us quite well. It was fast and easy to set up. A lot of these safari vehicles and uh, game blinds and watering holes are set up with camera mounts. So you can you know, take your 600,000 millimeter lens and, and uh, mount your camera right there and not have to bring a tripod in. 
So I'm, I'm going to take a, a shot at uh, answering the chanting. I'm, I'm assuming that it's, it's not chanting in the sense of making vocalizations. The, uh, the, the chanting goshawks are, are silent hunters. Um, perhaps they make vocalizations for mating, I'm not sure, but uh, um, I always kind of assumed it, it was short for enchanting, but that's just me kind of making that up because I, I just thought they were wonderful little birds. But they are largely silent, at least while they're hunting. And Randy, do you have a total count of how many birds you saw how many bird yeah, species? Yeah, uh, we we saw um, 248 species while we were there. And if you look up Randy or me on eBird, um, all the lists are there. We've got our stuff public. All right. Well, that's all the questions we have in the chat here. Okay. There's the goshawk. Oh, that's tail wind. Oh. Sorry, the chanting, I thought I grabbed that one. Yeah, just give one second, we'll see if we get a vocalization no, of the chanting. Dark chanting. That's the other cool thing about an app. There it is, there's a chant. Any other questions? And we're going to say thanks for uh, hanging in there with us, or if you did. Yeah, yeah. thanks for, uh, for joining us. It was um, really, really fun being able to share this with everyone. And um, any questions, is, you can email us or I'm on Facebook. All right, Randy and Kathy, thank you so much. Uh, a few messages here coming through about... Uh, you know, gratitude and thanks for sharing amazing pictures. So thank All you right, very well, much for your time. Awesome. Thank, thank you. you guys. Thank you for moderating, Alex. Uh, happy to help. Very, very helpful. So um, I guess this is Bon Voyage. Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much and have a good night, everyone. Thanks for All attending. Right. Yeah. Good night.